Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Freight B Moving All Things Logistics. First, let me get some announcements in. I know you guys have probably been wondering what's going on with the podcast. It was a daily show. We hadn't heard from it in a while. So due to scheduling constraints, the podcast is moving to a Friday weekly show and it will be a recap of highlights for the week so that you guys can get some of the best information that helps you do your day-to-day businesses or any other thing you may be doing. So I wanted to get that announcement out. The podcast is now going to a weekly show due to scheduling constraints and it will be released on Fridays by noon and you guys will be able to get a recap of some highlights of what is going on transportation logistics all things logistics and beyond this podcast is is expanding it is important that businesses especially small mid-sized businesses be able to get the information that can help them do better at being business owners That's the first thing. So with that, as some of you may or may not know, I am a part of the National Small Business Leadership Council. So the National Small Business Leadership Council, we are advocating for rulemaking and making sure that small businesses like you and I are being heard in front of our leadership being government. So with that, I've got some information that I want to share with you that was discussed in our meeting that we had yesterday. I'm part of the Economic Leadership Council. And this information I felt is is vital and important because it is going to impact small businesses. And there are a lot of us, especially in the transportation industry. Truckers are independent small businesses. Freight brokers, most of those are independent in small businesses. Most of your freight houses, they're, they're all small, mid-sized businesses. If you're not selling on the New York Stock Exchange, most of the time you're, you're a small business. So I want to get some information to you. Second, I also want to provide some leadership value to you as well. I, as most of you may have heard or know, I've spoken about, I am a John Maxwell speaker, coach, trainer, And a lot of the information that I learned as a John Maxwell leader has influenced how I operate my organization. And I just want to share that information with you. And I'm going to start today. I want to talk about the five things that we at John Maxwell do. We teach, we speak, we coach, we play the leadership game and we assess behavior. Those are the primary five things that we at John Maxwell do. We speak, we teach, we coach, we play the leadership game, and we assess behavior. And as leaders out there in your organizations, these are things you, if you're not doing, definitely I encourage you to start incorporating this system this this, these five steps on a daily basis with the people that you interact with that you work with as it will help improve your logistics operations it will it will begin to shift the mindset of how people in your organization work with each other and work with you so when I talk about teaching It's important to teach your team best practices. Best practices and what's the best way to take an order? What's the best way to process a phone call? What's the best way to look up a rate? What are the best systems to follow when you are putting together a transaction so that you make sure Due diligence is done. So you got to teach your people how to do that. You got to teach your people best practices. Without understanding best practices, 
people will go and do what they think is best and sometimes mistakes can be made from that now that doesn't mean that once you teach a best practice it cannot be improved upon if you find that there is a need for adjustments what it does do is it gets your people starting off now I say this because I know many freight brokers use freight agents that are not directly in the office. And also with remote work, a lot of people are working outside of the main office and they're working from home. So it is shifting the way day-to-day operations are working and it also opens up the processes to to where people will start to to do it their way to do whatever is comfortable for them and you want to pull that in so you want to in order to pull that in you got to teach your teams your best practices and your processes and have those rules in an SOP a standard operating procedures manual so that they can reference those things. And I know as small businesses, a lot of times we keep things in our head and we think once we tell someone they will get it, that stuff definitely needs, should be written down inside of a book and updated at minimum on a yearly basis, at minimum. So that's the first thing. The second thing is speaking to your team regularly. If you're not having daily speaking meetings at least be having them weekly a weekly time to speak to your team to inform them of any changes going on to get feedback from them about situations issues so that these things can be dealt with before they get out of hand so teaching them your best practices and speaking to them every day. Those are the first two things. Coaching. We coach people who we want to be successors. It's just like mentoring. And I know there's a lot of talk about, I can coach here, I can coach here, I can coach here. The coaching industry has become very popular. However, coaching should be done in-house. And if you as a leader may be lacking in your ability to coach, then that's definitely room for you to grow. But that shouldn't stop you from being a coach to your team to help your team grow and to put in place a successor or a sub team member who can step into your shoes and do the teaching do the speaking weekly or daily when you the main leader are out of the office so you know you you have your c-level group and then you've got your management group and most of this information is utilized by managers as they are that level between the c-suite and the other team members non-management level team members And the managers definitely need to be doing these five things on a regular and consistent basis. These things build trust, they build morale, and they also give team members a sense of belonging, a sense of I'm a part of this team and driving the success of the organization. So coach your people, find those people who you, can see their potential and begin to coach them and allow that to be a bilateral bilateral communication is key it should not be top down only it should be flowing communication should be flowing up to the management as well as flowing down to non-management team members and then the last one is assessing behavior reading people is a challenge However, it is a skill set, it is a soft skill set each leader should have. Knowing how to read your people. What does that mean? 
we communicate not just verbally, we communicate non-verbally 90% of the time through our facial expressions, through the tone of our voice, the inflection of our voice, body language, crossing your hands, that signifies something. Hands on the hips, that signifies something. Hands down below, cupped in front of you, that signifies something. All those gestures are people communicating, learning to assess the behavior of your team members is critical because it can help you identify when there are issues that need to be dealt with ASAP, when someone may be feeling hostile, and it can prevent you from having to deal with with outburst, and by that time it's too late. Now, I definitely understand people who may not be comfortable addressing people when they identify a aggressive behavior or someone who has a a pattern that may seem threatening. And I encourage those leaders, that's where your other coaching skills come in because you've coached somebody else who can deal with that. You've coached a sub team member to saying, hey, I see you're really good with that person over there. I, I, I'm, I would like for you to have a one-on-one with them. I, I'm seeing something in their behavior. I've observed it for the last X amount of days or what have you. I just want you to reach out to them on a one-on-one. I'm going to give you some time and if you would report back to me so that we, if you feel that there's something we really need to tackle on this, we can do that. That's where that comes into play. So as managers, as leaders, as business owners, these things are critical. So you want to be teaching your people. You want to be speaking to your people. You want to be coaching your people and you want to be assessing their behavior on a regular basis regular basis. All right. So that's my lesson for the day on leadership. Let's flip the script and let's get into this S or excuse me, the CTA situation that's going on that is going to impact small, mid-sized businesses. Actually all businesses is going to impact, but especially small businesses need to be aware this is coming and it's actually already been approved. So before I go any further, let's clear up some things. Who is NSBA, the National Small Business Association? It is an organization that's been around since 1937. And we have essentially a non, excuse me, let me slow my roll. So I'm gonna read from the website, my memory is is sticky today. So NSBA is a staunchly nonpartisan organization with decades of small business advocacy expertise from our long serving leadership to our knowledgeable and well connected government affairs team. We are proud to be the nation's first small business advocacy organization. We have gone to Congress to fight for small business needs and that's why we are here you have the small business association which is a government controlled entity we are a organization that advocates and connects with that group to make sure they've got small businesses best interest and that's why i'm a member of the team And I bring to them things I may see. They highlight things that they think is important. And I'm using this platform to help keep small businesses informed about these changes. Because there's little information that you see in the news about small business situations. And there's things happening all the time 
such as this. So that's the first thing. Now, we, the organization, have filed a lawsuit with uh, the, or excuse me, against the U.S. Department of Treasury. On Tuesday, November 15, 2022, the National Small Business Association filed suit against the U.S. Treasury Department to stop the Harmful Corporate Transparency Act. Now, you can learn more about this act if you're watching the YouTube channel. You can see here up on the screen, you can go to nsba.biz forward slash CTA, and that will get you some information And I'm going to give you some briefing right here today on the podcast for those of you who are listening. I also will have links to the information that I am talking about in the show notes, both on the podcast and on the YouTube channel. And you will be able to get the information there. So let's talk about what is this CTA? What is it? So I'm going to flip over to my screen here. To read from that, as you can see here up on the screen, this is the details. So it is the Beneficial Ownership Information Reporting. A final rule implementing the Beneficial Ownership Information Reporting requirements of the Corporate Transparency Act was issued in September 2022. These regulations go into effect on January 1st, 2024. So you still got a year before it actually takes effect. Beneficial ownership information will not be accepted prior to January 1st, 2024. It also says the Corporate Transparency Act, CTA, establishes uniform beneficial ownership information reporting requirements for certain types of corporations, limited liability companies, and other similar entities created in or registered to do business in the United States. The CTA authorizes FinCEN to collect that information and disclose it to authorized government agencies and financial institutions subject to effective safeguards and controls. The CTA and its implementations regarding, excuse me, the CTA and its implementations regulations will provide essential information to law enforcement NASA security agencies and others to help prevent criminals, terrorists, proliferators, and corrupt oligarchs from hiding illicit money or other property in the United States. The CTA is part of the Anti-Money Laundering Act of 2020, AML Act. More information on the AML Act can be found on the AML Act page. So when I post the link to what I'm reading here off of the FinCEN website, you'll be able to click on other links on this page to get you more information. For example, you can read more about the final rule, the final rule news release of September 29, 2022, and the final rule fact sheet from September 29, 2022. I am going to highlight some key things as to why we are suing there there is a huge privacy concern about the information this act is asking for now currently your business information is public Now, most of you who are freight brokers and in the transportation industry, you know your information is already public because anyone who is interested in doing business with you can reference your information on the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration's website called Safer Web. And the purpose of that website is to make sure that you are registered as an authority to transact as a freight broker, a freight forwarder, or some type of carrier, whether that be rail, ocean, road, transportation, and so forth. So your information is essentially already public. In addition, 
When you register your organization, your LLC, your your 501c3, whatever type of company you form a shell for, you form that with a secretary of state, whether you do that in Delaware or whether you do that in your native, your, your core state that you do business in, your business becomes public. It is already public on the Secretary of State's website. However, there's only a, a limited amount of information that is obtained from that. But there is enough on there to establish who the beneficial owners are, who formed the company, and it may not have your phone number, but it does have an address of the business. So that information is already public. So I wanted to just stress that part because there has been some commentary about the concern of the business's information becoming public. And that information is already public. For those of you who may not be aware of that, um, I know because I can, I can source that information if I so need it. However, there are some pieces of information that are not public on these websites. And that is a privacy concern. When they created this CTA Act, the purpose of this act is to create a central database. So all of these 50 states, that information may, you if you wanted to reference information, you'd have to go to each of the 50 states and search for it. And it would give you a, enough information to understand who supposedly is the owners of the business. And then you would have to go to another website and find out if they were a transportation company. And you have to go to another website to find out something else. And so what they're doing is they're going to centralize all this so that those who want to know this information can access the information. And most of the people that they are helping are law enforcement. This is not about improving business relationships and making it easy for marketers. However, this can be a marketing tool and I I feel it will be used as such as soon as the cost and the opportunity to earn income from it become relevant. And that's another topic. So that's the first piece of the CTA situation. So I want to go over now and talk about two sections of this um, or, or two key sections that I think are definitely important. And it re it's in regards to what information they are asking for in particular. Like I said, most of your information is already out there. Your name of your business, who, who set up the business, your, uh, your done D and B number. If somebody has a Dun and Bradstreet account, your D and B number can be accessed on Dun and Bradstreet if they have a membership and they're requiring businesses to obtain a Dun & Bradstreet number. Now that's good for Dun & Bradstreet because they can sell you more products. However, some businesses right now, they may have a Dun & Bradstreet, but the profile is not complete or they just have a shell that's there. And now they're about to fill all of that information in because it's going to be required by law. Now, what I've got on my screen here is section B, which as I was reading through that, I found it to be very important. It is actually in an under um, sub, subsection three, which states information to be reported regarding beneficial owners and company applications. Part A of that is name, date of birth, and address. 
Yes, they want your name, they want your date of birth, and they want your address in this system. Currently, that date of birth is not a part of your requirement to report as a business owner. And the biggest concern is identity theft. We know many databases have been hacked. They have been hacked and our information has been exposed. And here you're asking for us to give up more information and put into this central system to include our name, address, and date of birth. So that's the first concern. This part B is asking for a unique identifying number and image from identification documents. And that is the height of the concern. So now you've got my name, you've got my business, you have my date of birth, you have my address. Now you've got my picture and you want a unique identification number. Now, most businesses have what's called an EIN number and you obtain that through the IRS. If you're a sole proprietor, you're using a social security number, which you should be, I definitely encourage you to get an EIN number, it's free. And that way you can separate your social security number from being out there in the public. So this unique identification number and image, the proposed rule, it reads this, Proposed 31 CFR 1010 380 B12 specified that for each individual who is a beneficial owner or company applicant, a unique identifying number must be reported from one of four types of acceptable identification documents a non expired U.S. passport, a non expired state, local, or tribal identification document a non-expired state issued driver's license, or if an individual lacks one of those other documents, a non-expired foreign transport, or excuse me, foreign passport. Proposed 31 CFR 1010-380-B12 also required the reporting company to provide an image of the identification document from which the unique identifying number was obtained. So they want images also to support this information. Now, if you're using your passport, you're not, they're not going to say, Oh, don't take out your picture. They're going to say, we need your picture included. Same with the driver's license. We need to make sure that the person who you're saying this belongs to, it actually belongs to that person. So we're going to need you to give us the identific the facial part of that driver's license. So you can see how this can become a privacy issue. You can see how this is opening up to more than just corporate transparency. Now in this article, I read, quite a bit. It is very lengthy. Um, if you have screen reader, I would definitely encourage you to use screen reader. It says here on my screen reader, it's a seven hour read. Just this page alone is seven hours to read. And so I'll, I have skimmed through it to give you all the highlights. I'm going to have the link in the show notes so that you can reference this yourself. If you got a Saturday, you got a screen reader, highlight and, and let it read it to you. You put it on really fast, it can go faster. All right, so the final rule for that proposed rule was as follows. And I'm just gonna read the, per, the, the you know, a little bit just to give you an idea of what it says, because like I said, this is very lengthy. So the final rule states, the final rule adopts the proposed 31 CFR 1010-380-B12. Regarding the types of acceptable identification document 
that reporting companies may submit with respect to beneficial owners and company applicants with minor clarification edits. Specifically, FinCEN has clarified that reporting companies must specify what jurisdiction issued the identification document from which a beneficial owner's unique identifying number came. This information is necessary to ensure the identifying number can be identified as unique and valid and to avoid situations where two different individuals may have the same identifying number. Finson considered comments regarding the potential for alternatives where an acceptable identification number is unavailable. However, CTA is clear in identifying the four specific types of identification documents that are acceptable. While FinCEN recognizes that circumstances may arise where obtaining such documents may present burdens, the CTA does not contemplate alternatives to the four common and reliable forms of identification documents that are extremely enumerated in 31 U.S.C. 5336A1. In addition, the statute is clear that a foreign passport may be used only, only, if the other enumerated forms of identification documents are not available and FinCEN is not ex making any changes in response to the comments on the issue. Now, that's just part of the, the uh, paragraph. It continues on, and I definitely encourage you all to read that and get an understanding. There are penalties that will be issued if these rules are not followed. They are given a whole year to 2024. And those businesses like myself who have already started, we will have so many uh, days to file the initial filing of about our businesses. And then new businesses, I think they have like 30 days to get that information. As I was reading some of this, I understand that this is about preventing the bad players in business from getting away with laundering money through the United States. It, it's not that it's going to totally stop that. It's going to help them identify those individuals faster. And they gave a couple of ex examples, especially in regards to what is going on with the war in Russia and how they identified several bad players that were conducting business with Russia that they had in, in uh, when the United States had already placed sanctions on Russia. And that's what they want to stop. They also highlighted a couple of cases where people fraudulently obtained PPP money and billions and millions of dollars. And so all of this is, a, a you, all, you all know, it's all about controlling money. It's all about keeping money from getting into the wrong hands and, mis and doing dirty tricks with it. As I've talked about before on this show, the transportation industry currently is infested with bad players to the point that myself as a broker am hesitant to even do broker deals because of the inability to see the person and know that who they say they are, they are. I have heard stories about double brokering, triple brokering, and that line going so deep, it, I don't even know where it ends. There is no reason for that to be happening, but it is. And I know that to register as a freight broker, you do not have to be a United States citizen. Matter of fact, you don't even have to be in the United States. You can be a freight broker outside of the United States. You, that to me is mind boggling. Yet it is happening right now. So somebody can t be calling me, telling me that they're a driver and they're located outside the country. Then they take that load and then they resell that load to somebody else. That person picks it up. I pay who I think I'm paying, but then that person doesn't pay the driver who actually moved it. 
Now that driver figures out I'm the one that originally had the load, comes to me saying, I didn't get my money. I say, I gave it to you. He says, no, you didn't. You gave it to somebody else. Now more money has to come out of my pocket and there's a charge against my bond. That right there is the bad players in the freight transportation business. That right there. And this law does have some value in stopping that. However, again, will it stop that? It's debatable. Do we need a facial identification number and identity put on a central website to identify who's doing business with whom? Will we as small business owners be able to access that information to help our businesses be safe and to prevent perpetrators upon our business when they call to solicit us? Because if every small business LLC, a registered entity doing business in the United States or with the United States or claims to have a business address in the United States, Will they be, have access to it? Will I be able to identify them? These are a lot of questions that I have about this bill. And like I said, I know it has some value to it. I know it is important. However, I do question whether or not it will do what it says it's going to do. So with that, I want to sign off and ask you guys, leave some comments below. I definitely wanna hear, if you are a small business being impacted or about to be impacted by this, what do you feel about this? Do you think that our government has the right to tell us to give up all of our identity to be stored on a central database? And if you would like to support the National Small Business Association. You can go over to the website and find out some more information about that. I definitely encourage you to read through this information as much as you can. And as I get updates, as I learn more about this, I am definitely going to be providing you with as much information as I can to help you be able to be uh, in regulation make sure that you're not getting in trouble while you're out there conducting your transportation and logistics businesses. So I hope this information was helpful to you. Remember, every day you want to teach, coach, speak, play the leadership game, and assess behavior. And with that, if you are a 18, 14, 2, 4, if you walking, but if you rolling, I'm going to need you to be safe. If you're walking, watch out for them. Sometimes they don't know what they're doing. But I want you all to be safe. And I will see you next Friday with a recap of the week and bringing you some valuable information. Peace and love. Have a great weekend. See you later. Bye.